When you buy a new MacBook, you kind of expect it to last a long time because they're expensive. Early reviews are usually good, but the real question is how long they will hold up after a year or two years. And some old MacBooks are still around well after 10 years. Can the new ones do the same? Well, we'll see in 10 years. But for now, I've been using the 16 inch M2 Max MacBook Pro for over a year. And here's what I found out about its long-term performance. To make the long story short, overall buying this machine was a mistake, but I've been really happy with it anyway. More on that in a bit. So I've taken a lot more trips with this machine than my previous daily driver, which was the M1 Max MacBook Pro. Um, for obvious reasons, that one was a pandemic baby. And each time I took a trip like that, I remembered that I do have a couple of MacBook Airs laying around for doing software developer tests on this channel, but I just can't bring myself to give up the power of the M2 Max. Even though the aging M2 MacBook Air is fully capable of doing pretty much anything I can throw at it, mobile and web app development, tons of tabs open and Chrome, even editing these videos on the go. Yet I still want to do things faster and on a larger screen. Now I wanna tell you more about how I've been using my machine, what I've thought about it initially and what I think about it now and why I'm not on the M3 Max right now. But first I gotta pay the bills. I recently got this Ugreen Nexode X 160 watt charger and it's quickly become my go-to for easing my daily load. Now I've used Ugreen chargers for a while. My compact 30 watt charger and the MagSafe stand for my night table, both of which I've purchased last year have been excellent. So I was excited to try their new Nexode line, expecting it to resolve several issues for me. This 160 watt brick can actually be smaller than Apple's 140 watt with four ports instead of just one, thanks to the high speed GAN technology. It's using Power Delivery 3.1, allowing me to charge two laptops, my iPad and iPhone all at once. My 16 inch MacBook Pro can go to 50% in just 27 minutes. And I don't have to worry about overheating or short circuits because of the upgraded thermal guard protection system 2.0. Here are its little siblings, the 100 watt and the 65 watt. They're so tiny. Now you've seen my travel charger kit in previous videos. Now I can replace these chargers with one compact U-Green charger and get even more ports. Or if I really want to be the boss, I can just pack all these into my travel kit and have 10 outputs instead of three. And if design matters to you, U-Green's brick matches MacBooks even better than the Apple one. Use the link in the description to check them out. Now speaking of design, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but the notch is still around. However, just like the Troxler effect, which shows how our eyes adjust to things, our brain gets used to the notch and starts ignoring it, effectively tuning it out. I haven't even noticed the notch for years, unless I stare right at it. Why would you stare at the notch? That's silly. Don't stare at the notch. A couple of things about ports. I do find myself using my dock more. I even have a collection going on over here. This one I use for traveling because it's tiny. More ports would always be better, even if it's just one more port on the right side. Please, Apple, M4s. By the way, before the M3, the M2s didn't chamfer their ports, and if you look really close, you'll be able to notice some wear around the sharp edges of the ports. It's not terrible though, and you'd really have to look. The M3 models have fixed this. The keyboard, while good to type on, still gets easily worn down and shiny, which annoys me. It makes it look like I was just eating pizza and potato chips all day and didn't want to wash my hands. But this isn't anything new and it's not different on the M3 either. I just wish Apple would take care of this. And in my opinion, the most important design decision of the last three generations is MagSafe. This is what I was most excited about when the first Apple Silicon MacBook Pros with the new design came out in 2021. However, my interest was quickly lost when I spent most of the time at my desk tethered to a dock that charges my MacBook. Now, many of you in the comments said that this is why I had an issue with the battery in my M1 Max, losing the total capacity down to 87% in just one year. And you recommended that if my charge is low, I should plug in via MagSafe to get the optimal charging instead of via the dock with USB-C. Well, with this machine, I made sure to always charge with MagSafe, which delivers the full 140 watts and only use USB-C power once the battery is full. And I've been doing that over a year, like a good little boy since I had this machine. Well, let's check out my battery health now on the M2 for an update on how that's going. About this Mac, more info, system report, power, and maximum capacity is at 87%. What is it about 87% that MacBooks like so much? That's the same percentage that I had on my M1 Max. And I've been plugging this in. Cycle count 140. Do you also have 87%? Leave a comment down below if you're at 87 or whatever your percentage is. Just curious. Is it stuck on 87? What's going on, Apple? As for daily usage, when I leave my house to go to work from a cafe, I don't bother bringing the adapter along anymore. I've gotten pretty used to the idea at this point, and I don't even panic anymore when I notice that my battery 
batteries halfway down like I used to because at that point I've already been working for four to six hours and it's time to go home anyway. All day battery life is a reality folks and that's the reality I've been living in since my M1 Max. The M2 Max is no exception. Okay just to give you an idea of what my typical setup looks like. I've got a couple of instances of VS Code open that I'm working on. I have the terminal with node server running. I have Chrome with a bunch of tabs. Not that many. I think I've cleared up a little bit. I have another instance of Chrome for some experimental stuff. I use Todoist to keep track of my to-do list and Notion to keep track of my notes. I also do some creative work like Photoshop. Photoshop is open a lot of the times and Premiere Pro I only open when I'm editing videos. Not all the time. It's pretty resource intensive. And occasionally I have Xcode open in Android Studio as well as my SQL Workbench. In the background I currently have Dropbox, Creative Cloud, Parallels Toolbox, ThinkBuddy, and out of the 64 gigabytes of physical memory I'm using 38 right now. Almost three gigabytes of swap. Why? <laughs> I don't know what's going on back there. You know, Mac OS is doing its thing. I can't complain about 64 gigabytes of RAM. It's been great. And I've been using 64 gigabytes since 2018. Now with my next machine, I'll probably upgrade that because when I tried to run a large, a large language model, an LLM on this, and it was the Mixtral 8x7, it would not run unless I quantized it further. And I, I just got fed up with running large models on this thing. You really do need a lot of RAM to run those. And I have a couple of videos. I'll link to some down below where I show how to do that. Moving on to portability, just want to touch upon this again. Yes, it is a heavy machine and the MacBook Airs do weigh a lot less. And when you've got your kids' backpacks and your own backpacks and this five pound machine, you're really starting to feel it, especially with the accessories you bring. It also matters when you're flying and you got a little tiny tray table in economy class and you kind of have to sit like this, staring down at your MacBook Pro. 13 inch MacBook Pro or MacBook Air would actually work better for the airplane rides. But I suffer anyway with my 16 inch because I still like it. Oh, there's also the 14 inch MacBook Pro. I usually don't consider that one. And I made a video about why. I'll link to that one down below too. But it's a perfectly valid choice for people. Let's talk about compatibility. Initially, when Macs came out with Apple Silicon, there were very few programs that were compatible. And that's why Rosetta 2 was created to translate the x64 programs into ARM. It did a really good job, hardly noticeable at times. But still, whenever I compare ARM versions of software with their x64 equivalents, the ARM versions were always more performant and faster. And that probably had an effect on battery life too. It's been about four years now since Apple Silicon came out. You can still take a look at does it ARM because it looks like it is being updated, but it also looks like more apps are being added to it under the unsupported section. So yeah, if you're still wondering whether your software is supported or not, check out does it ARM and it'll tell you if the software you're running runs natively on ARM or not. Now, I've done videos on this channel covering what software I use, what software is compatible and what's not from a software developer perspective. But that's not the point of this video. I pretty much comfortably use my machine with everything that I use being compatible. Here's my activity monitor and I only have a couple of Intel things here. Intel is the x86 software that's being translated actively. Most of these are Apple now. That's all Apple Silicon compatible. So I don't have that many. Duet is famous for that. Uh, this is the Apogee audio interface. That's it's a good audio interface. That's all I'm going to say. But audio interface manufacturers have a hard time keeping up with the times. It's an industry thing, except logic for obvious reasons. That's an Apple product. Now what's mission critical are some of the things I do for .NET development. I still like to use Visual Studio for that. So I have to run Parallels, which is a virtualization software that allows me to run Windows on ARM on my Mac. It works quite well. I made several videos about it here, including a tutorial which I'll link down below. Visual Studio has been on ARM for a couple years now too, and it runs very nicely. And finally, I have a workflow that uses PyTorch and some dependencies that rely on CUDA, which needs an NVIDIA graphics card. And for that, I still use my dedicated ASUS gaming laptop with an RTX 3070 in it. Now, I've recently tested the MSI machine with an RTX 4090 on this channel for some machine learning tasks, but for me, it wasn't worth the price tag. Maybe I'll upgrade once the 5090s come out, or perhaps now that Apple's MLX frame framework is gaining more support. I'll be able to use that for my workflows, although not without some conversion from PyTorch, I'm afraid. But I'm glad to see work is being done on that. As compatibility goes, Apple's done a fantastic job providing Rosetta 2 and then essentially forcing developers to release ARM versions of their software. Kind of reminds me of a lizard losing its tail. I know it's kind of a nasty example, but if you chop off a lizard's tail, it regrows it, at least in theory. Well, that's what Apple did. It kind of chopped things off and forced developers to regrow their software in ARM. 
weird example. That's something that worries me a little bit with Microsoft's Windows for ARM, but that's a whole different story. They're not cutting off the x86 or x64 stuff. They're doing ARM stuff on top of that. Different story, different videos. By the way, if you are interested in those, I got a few Windows for ARM machines coming in, so don't miss those. Now, you might be wondering, why am I sticking with the M2 Max and not upgrading to the M3 Max? And that is a great question, especially since I had the chance to test out the entire line of the M3s on this channel. But to answer that, let's take a step back for a moment. The transition to Apple Silicon was monumental. I saw massive improvements when I moved from my 2019 MacBook Pro with the Intel Core i9 to the M1 MacBook Pro and subsequently to the M1 Max MacBook Pro. These upgrades were game changers. However, after upgrading from the M1 Max to the M2 Max, the difference were less pronounced, to say the least. About a year ago, I switched from the M1 Max to the M2 Max, which felt like a slight upgrade, but essentially performed the same. If you put both of those machines in front of me and let me test my things, my workflows on each one of those, I probably wouldn't even notice. And this switch cost me about a thousand dollars. Essentially, I rented the M1 Max for a year at that price. That's kind of how I think about it because I sold it. So from a return on investment standpoint, it wasn't great. And this is why I'm so happy with the M2 Max, yet overall, I think it was a mistake to upgrade from the M1 Max. Now, regarding the M3 Max, I did test it thinking that it might be my next go-to machine. I actually spec'd it out to be the same as my M2. However, I quickly realized it was just another small step up from the M2 Max. It's better, yes, but only marginally so. Given this, I decided to stick with my M2 Max until something more substantial comes out, perhaps the M4. We'll see. If you're debating whether to upgrade from the M1, M2, or even the M3, you might want to hold your horses. With the pace Apple is going, we might soon see the M4 series. Given that, it might be wise to wait a little bit and see what's next in the pipeline. From my experience, while the M3 is a decent step up, the improvements over the M2 are minimal and might not justify the upgrade costs, especially if you currently have an M1 or an M2. These older machines are still incredibly powerful and efficient for most needs. I'd recommend holding off on the M3 and waiting for more substantial upgrades where you can really feel the difference in performance and get more bang for your buck. If you're watching this after the newer models have been released, keep an eye out for sales. I'll put the latest links uh, to any deals I find in the description down below. So whether you're a current MacBook owner or looking to become one, it might be best to wait for something truly groundbreaking at this point. But you know, I always say if you need a machine right now to do your work, get a machine now. And you can get a pretty good deal on an M1 or an M2 machine. And I made a video about refurbished Apple machines. You can find that video right over here. Thanks for tuning in and I'll catch you in the next one.